Good afternoon or good evening for some. My name is C.K. Hoffler and I have the honor of being the president of the National Bar Association. This is such a magnificent time of the year. Um, we're towards the end of my bar year and I say it's a magnificent time because we have the opportunity to showcase who I believe are really some of the greatest talent that we have in our bar, our young lawyers. This series, Young Lawyers on the Go, is new. And the reason why we wanted to have this series to showcase the extraordinary talent of our young lawyers is because our young lawyers are our future. They're extraordinary, they're everywhere. People don't often focus on the, the, the talent that we have within, but I thought we're gonna put an end to that. I worked so closely this year with Anika Williams, who's chair of the Young Lawyers Division, and I've just been so impressed. You know, all of the lawyers who comprise that division, whenever we needed them to do anything, they were absolutely always there, showing up, showing out with their talent. And I couldn't be prouder. I feel like a mama bear when I talk about them, when I talk about Anika Williams, when I talk about Chloe Woods, who put this program together. When I talk about Akua Kapak, my chief of staff, and I know Chloe is a deputy chief of staff, um, who's just been phenomenal, phenomenal this year. I mean, I don't make a move without Akua. And these are young lawyers. And, and while I perhaps lie about my age and say that I'm in this group of young lawyers, we all know that if I've been a lawyer for 34 years, there's no way I'm part of YLD, but I am in spirit. So this is the second seminar in a four-part series. The first one was on data privacy and cybersecurity, which was extraordinary last week. And, and for those lawyers who are seasoned, who have been lawyers for 34 years like me or 20 plus years, or even just starting out, what we want to realize and have people realize at the National Bar Association is you're never too young or too old to learn from each other. Indeed, every single solitary time that I'm sitting with young lawyers from our organization, I learn something. I learn how to be more contemporary, how more high tech, how better, how more whatever, um, because they teach us how to do it best. And we can teach them or give them the benefit of our wisdom, having been there and for some of us having broken through glass ceilings. So against that backdrop, it gives me great pleasure to open up this session called Sports and Entertainment Law. And we're, we're going to hear from some of the, just the biggest and the baddest young men and women that are in this country practicing sports and entertainment law, young people. But first, I have the pleasure of introducing a woman who needs no introduction in our National Bar Association family. I've referred to her three times already, and that's Anika Williams. She's chair of YLD, the Young Lawyers Division of the National Bar. She's done a phenomenal job, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce Onika Williams. And Onika, thank you so much again for all that you do and have done for the National Bar, and I am so proud of you. Onika? Thank you, Madam President. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as you heard, my name is Onika Williams, and I'm chair of the National Bar Association Young Lawyers Division. Welcome to Young Lawyers on the Go, Sports and Entertainment Law. Thank you to Madam President Hoffler and Chief of Staff Kopik for always championing young lawyers in everything you do. This year, Madam President's team has done amazing out-of-the-box work across the country in a pandemic, during uprisings, while fighting against police brutality, during the 2020 general election and the Georgia Senate runoffs. And Madam President has made sure that the Young Lawyers Division has had a seat at the table every step of the way. The YLD is the home of the young lawyer within the NBA and represents the interests of young black attorneys under the age of 40 years old or originally admitted to practice within the past 10 years, whichever is more inclusive. This year's NBA YLD theme 2020 and beyond, recognizing the importance of the young lawyer has been seen throughout seven programmatic areas. One, election protection, voter registration, and education. Two, COVID-19 recovery efforts. Three, efforts to eliminate police brutality. All three of these are what Madam President refers to as the three pandemics affecting our communities. And YLD was so serious about them, we adopted them into our programmatic areas. Four, 2020 census efforts and 2021 redistricting efforts. Five, professional and skills development. Six, 
mental health and wellness, and seven, pipeline programs and mentorship opportunities. Today's program is just one of the many ways Madam President has made sure that the Young Lawyers Division of the NBA is informed and ready to compete on the national stage. NBA YLD also has some upcoming events that we would love to have you join us at. On Friday, June 18th at 11 a.m. Eastern, 8 a.m. Pacific, we will be co-hosting the 2021 Young Lawyer Summit, Building Bridges in a Challenging Legal Landscape with several other Young Lawyers visions. The event is open to all law students and young lawyers across the country. We will also be celebrating the inaugural National Young Lawyers Week this month. Follow NBA YLD social media accounts for more details, and we'll put that information in the chat. So thank you, Madam President Hoffler, and we hope you enjoy tonight's event. Now you will hear from the Young Lawyers Division Chair-Elect Chloe Woods. Chloe? Thank you, Anika. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so again, my name is Chloe Woods. I serve as the chair-elect. I'll be uh, sworn in the as incoming chair of the National Bar Young Lawyers Division uh, at this year's convention, our virtual convention. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to that opportunity. It's been a crazy wild ride this year, um, as both uh, Anika and uh, President Hoffler mentioned, all the work that's been done in the pandemic and during you know, Zoom. So I'm just excited to be able to continue with that tradition of the work that they've started um, and, and kind of keep that going. So with no further ado, let's get the uh, panel going. We have our moderator, Shay M. Lawson, who I have the pleasure of introducing. So Shay M. Lawson is an Atlanta-based intellectual property and entertainment attorney. She's named to Billboard Magazine's 2021 Top Music Lawyers list and a Super Lawyers 2020 Rising Star honoree. Shea was recognized in the top 2.5% of intellectual property attorneys practicing in the state of Georgia. She's the managing attorney at the firm Lawson McKinley, where she negotiated, she's negotiated millions in client deals and in connection with brands such as Nike, Bravo TV, ABC, Dis Discovery, um, Discovery Channel, iHeartMedia, and Microsoft. Shea has become well-known in the music industry for protecting the brand and legacies of multi-platinum Grammy award-winning artists, songwriters, engineers, and producers, and has served two consecutive terms as a board member for the Atlanta chapter of the Songwriters of North America in 2021. Her work protecting clients <clears throat> has been featured by Black Enterprise, Rolling Stone, The Hollywood Reporter, Atlanta Business Chronicle, um, Exo Nicole, and Essence. So please join me in welcoming our moderator, Shay M. Lawson. Thank you so much, Chloe. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Onika. It is a pleasure to moderate the panel. I know that we have a lot to fit in in a short period of time. And so I am not going to hesitate. I'm going to go right into introducing our panel. First, we have Rebecca Belliard. She is an Associate Corporate Counsel at Amazon Music. In her role as Associate Corporate Counsel, she negotiates deals with major record labels, independent record labels, performance rights organizations such as BMI and ASCAP. She works on podcast deals for Amazon Music's newly launched podcast platform. Prior to working for Amazon Music, Rebecca worked at Ackerman LLP. Her practice focused on a wide range of transactional matters, including contract negotiations, mergers and acquisitions, intellectual property, and general corporate matters. Um, Rebecca currently serves as an advisory board member for the Sports and Business Leadership Association. She also serves as the professional development coordinator for South Florida's Black Professional Network and launched a career coaching platform focused on assisting young professionals in career transitions. She is also involved in national and local bar associations, such as the ABA's Forum on Entertainment and Sports Law, the Black Entertainment and Sports Lawyers Association, the Haitian Lawyers Association, and the Caribbean Bar Association. Welcome to the panel, Rebecca. Next, I have Daniel Prescott. Daniel is Business and Legal Affairs in-house counsel for Levity Live, a multi-entity non-scripted television production company that also owns and operates the improv comedy clubs and brand. As in-house counsel, he provides strategic legal advice to his clients related to television, media, entertainment, production, music, clearance, licensing, sponsorships, 
branding, copyright, trademarks, and privacy rights. Daniel has experience negotiating development and production series agreements and production talent agreements with various media and entertainment companies and A-list talents. Prior to joining Levity, he spent eight years as business and legal affairs attorney at Pilgrim Media Group and Bona Murray Productions. Last but certainly not least, we have Nicole Theodore, who is on our panel. She is the founding and managing partner of the Theodore Firm and a 2004 graduate of the Florida State University in Tallahassee, Tennessee. Um, while she practiced, uh, before opening her firm, she spent six years in federal practice with the prestigious Cochrane firm in Atlanta. After leaving the Cochrane firm, she breached out on her own, representing former NFL athletes, helping them navigate second careers. Her practice has since expanded to include entrepreneurs, athletes and entertainers of all kind, helping them realize their dreams. Attorney Theodore has successfully represented various business owners and helping them remain legally protected, as well as having successfully negotiated entertainment deals with large production companies and several major networks. Welcome to the panel, Nicole and Daniel. I am going to start this panel with a very traditional question that I think a lot of young attorneys have in determining what is the difference between being in-house and outside counsel. And so I will start with you, Rebecca, and then we can go to Daniel and Nicole. What is the biggest misconception about your job as in-house counsel at a major organization? Sure. Um... So again, thanks for having me um, on the panel. I appreciate the invite. Um, and as based off of my introduction, you'll see that I have both um, inside uh, in-house experience as well as law firm experience. So I've re recently transitioned in-house about 10 months ago. And I'd say the biggest misconception is that I think folks think when you go in-house, it's kind of like you just get to cruise um, and, and you send all your work to outside counsel. I, I wish that was the case. <laughs> But no, not really, not at all, actually. So one thing I think that is a, a very big misconception is that you just stop learning, you stop growing, and you're basically just doing project management. Um, I can say, at least for Amazon, it's a very innovative company, and we're always doing something new that hasn't been done before. So um, really having to stay on top of things and continuously learning, doing your CLEs, and then just understanding on how to advise your business partners is, I think, really key. Um, we of course utilize outside counsel, but I think that is a is, is a misconception that you know when folks go in house, then it's kind of just a just a kind of chilling and not really doing much. But um, I have learned that that's very uh, much not so true. Um, and uh, yeah, that that's what I'd have to say is the biggest misconception from my end. All right, Daniel. Yeah, to piggyback off of uh, Rebecca's statement, um, you it's very much so. You have to be a jack of all trades. Um, on a daily basis, we deal with anything ranging from torts matters to criminal aspects as it relates to releasing talent, or if we're trying to feature a particular part or a particular aspect in one of our episodes, and it happens to involve someone that has either a criminal background or we're saying something that's defamatory about an individual, we have to become, like I said, a jack of all traits. And so you're not just dealing with your run-of-the-mill production-related concerns or your run-of-the-mill um, venue-related concerns. There's just a little bit of everything. So I'll have to piggyback off of her statement. Okay, awesome. Nicole, what do you think is the biggest misconception that you have, and, and you're running your own firm, about what you do on a day-to-day -day basis or what it's like being in sports and entertainment as an attorney? Um, yeah, I mean, I hate to be the one to piggyback off the piggyback, but it's <laughs> it's very much so the case. I think I'm I probably am the only non in house um, attorney on the panel, um, but most of what um, Rebecca and Daniel do, I also do just for different organizations instead of just one. Um, I think I considered going in house when I first decided to go this route. Um, and I think it's exactly what Daniel and Rebecca have said that people think that you're pigeonholed into doing one thing and you're essentially an employee 
of an organization just like everyone else. Um, but you really do have to be a jack of all trades. I think for me, since I deal with in-house counsel, whether it's on opposing sides of you know something I'm working on, or if um, I get something referred out from in-house because of a conflict or what have you, um, we're essentially doing the same thing. And it, it's just in the fact that with in-house, your client is obviously the, the organization that you work for. Um, and for me, I have several different clients, several different organizations um, that I work for. And a lot of my clients are kind of um, with production companies, at least more mid-size or small, and they can't afford in-house counsel to have on staff, or if it's a situation where they have several different attorneys and they just keep them all um, outside. But the biggest misconception, I agree 100%, um, is that you really kind of, it's all just Hollywood going to red carpets and you know being at these events with your clients where if you do get to do that that's great but most of the time it's you're really grinding. <laughs> Very, very true. Um, I want to actually take it back to Daniel and going back to the point of being a jack of all trades. I think people misunderstand all of the layers that it takes to be in-house counsel. And when I was going over your bio where you're like, okay, it's rights to publicity, it's contracts. I saw a little bit of employment at the end. What are some key legal practice areas that you believe are critical that if you say, okay, these are the top three practice areas that you really need to be sharp in if you're considering an in-house career in sports or entertainment? Oh, well, with me, I work um, in non-scripted in the non-scripted field. So I would say the three areas would have to be contracts, but contracts is, is, is so vague and it encompasses and it covers a lot of different aspects. But the un, having the understanding of negotiations um, is very important. And just to give you sort of like a top level of kind of what we do, um, let's say for example, the development team reaches out to us and they say, we're interested in this sort of show idea with outside talent or an outside production entity. And we want to have them attached. So development will reach out to us and we'll negotiate that agreement with them that essentially goes into detail, like the rights that we need in order to go to the network and pitch the concept to the network. Um, once the network decides that they want to produce that particular show, they said that they said they're going to purchase, you know, the deal. Uh, we'll negotiate the PSA, the production services agreement. And then after that, you kind of go into your, your world of, of torts, invasion of privacy, copyright, as it relates to producing the show with the production partner. Um, so I would say that contract negotiations, invasion of privacy, copyright, and then a little bit of just having a, a, a good understanding of how to mediate certain situations. Because of course, with the client, you're dealing with outside parties and you're also dealing with a client and you have to come to sort of this compromise as it relates to how we produce the show. So it's probably not an area of law that people discuss much, but there's a lot of mediation and, and negotiation of relationships. Relationships are super key and getting people to see both sides. I remember hearing at a CLE once that Joel Katz is always quoted as saying that he was able to close a lot of deals because he was able to make both sides believe that they had gotten the best deal, that everybody walked away feeling like they had gotten the best deal. And I think that's a great part of just learning the skill of negotiation and understanding what both sides are looking for. Rebecca, I want to take it to you at Amazon, because if you are a young lawyer and you are honing your skills in torts and contracts and mediation negotiation are those qualities that a really prestigious organization like amazon is looking for in a new hire or an employee or an associate or where do you think the things are within your organization that makes attorneys stand out as ideal candidates or just great employees yeah that's a that's a great question um I'll say this about Amazon as an organization, um, although I'm not speaking on behalf of Amazon, <laughs> I must say that the disclaimer, right. um, I will say that, you know, they're looking for smart lawyers that, you know, have a skill set, you know, what in whatever area you practice in, right? So prior to going to Amazon, I was doing M&A. 
And um, I have some colleagues who may have worked, you know, in l and labor and employment, some colleagues who are purely intellectual property. We face so many new issues that you really just want people who are willing to work hard, be able to figure out, you know, these complex issues, try to find solutions to these issues. And, you know, you don't, we, we don't expect someone to know it all because again, we're dealing like with things that have never been done before. I have a colleague who was just hired as a robotics lawyer. What, what does that really mean? <laughs> but she has to learn everything to do, like e anything that has to deal with robots and delivering packages, that's gonna be her, you know, her area to, to focus on. So what I always tell students and young lawyers is to whatever you're doing, do it well, right? Mm -hmm. um, hone in on your craft, hone in on your skills, and if you are, you know, an M&A lawyer, really learn the different parts of an, an agreement, understand how they work together, understand how people negotiate deals. If you're in labor and employment, understand how having a child on set is going to make a big difference and how you forgot to include that in the agreement. That's going to be, a, you know, it's going to be problematic. Um, really take what you have and elevate it. And, and oftentimes, especially for entertainment and sports, a lot of people want to get into entertainment and sports, but it's a business and you have to think of it as a business, right? So um, there are going to be real estate issues that affect entertainment and sports world. There are going to be IP issues. There's so many different areas of the law that touch this industry. And to just say, like, I want to do entertainment law is, is too vague. You want to really focus in and hone in on a specific area and then develop that skill set. Ooh, that is so great. That actually takes me perfectly <laughs> into my next question. You guys are reading my mind with these questions today. And I want to take it to Nicole because you are serving so many different clients in so many different facets. And so what do you think are key areas that are emerging that you're starting to see that young lawyers should maybe look out for? Rebecca just talked about robotics. I know there's a lot of conversation about like NFTs and different things like that. What are emerging trends that you are seeing that maybe young attorneys should keep their eyes on to maybe specialize in if they're interested in sports and entertainment? Sorry. Um, yeah, sure. I think I didn't even think about the robotics thing. I think that makes sense with the package delivery service. Um, so that's that's not my area, but sounds really interesting. Um, with NFTs, definitely um, people are wanting to get paid in Bitcoin now and how to work that into these structured deals. Um, you do at least need to have a working knowledge um, of how that works um, as that becomes more and more prevalent. Um, and when I say people want to get paid in Bitcoin, I haven't seen it as much yet in, on the entertainment side. Um, either Daniel or Rebecca may disagree with that, but definitely on the sports side. Um, we're seeing now with, um, we just had the NBA draft not too long ago, and people are wanting to get their signing bonuses in, in Bitcoin. Um, so you definitely, I had to, you know, learn what an NFT is and how, um, what the market trends are going to be in talk to someone who is a specialist in that area. And, and that's not even something when I first started out that I thought would even be a thing. Um, so that as well as um, on the sports side as well, um, name, image, and likeness um, has definitely been in the news a lot lately. There are five states that are getting ready to um, enact their NIL bills on July 1st in just a couple of weeks here. Um, my state where I'm at now, Georgia being one of them, so that's definitely going to change the landscape of, you know, what is amateurism in, in college sports now? Will they be able to make money off of their name, image, and likeness? Are they pooling like Georgia, um, where 75% of what an athlete makes off of their name, image, and likeness can be repooled and redistributed amongst the other athletes? Um, so there will be a lot of uh, legislation and litigation, I suspect, around um, these bills as they come into play. I think some other areas... Um, that I don't know necessarily aren't emerging, but I think are important is definitely securities um, when it comes to film and television financing and you have people investing, um, making sure that you have a, a good knowledge of how securities laws work both at the federal level and the state level is probably the only thing that I would add. And that's not new and emerging, but definitely something that um, that you should have knowledge of or bring in of counsel or someone like that if you're just not interested. <laughs> Okay, absolutely. I actually want to stay with you because Rebecca brought up something uh, just a moment ago and you talked about it a bit when you first came on 
Um, and she, Rebecca mentioned that she originally was in mergers and acquisitions and you brought up that you originally thought that you wanted to be in-house counsel and you spent time at the Cochrane firm and your path hasn't been a straight one. No one that I've introduced, myself mm -hmm. included, has had a straight path to where we are right now in our careers. And so my question to you, and I'll open it up after Nicole speaks to everybody else, if you want to chime in is, have you ever doubted yourself? on your path to where you are right now in your career and can you share an example of how you persevered jay i mean how much time <laughs> do we have on this <laughs> you that is a question and a question and a question <laughs> oh my gosh um so the short answer is yes absolutely i don't think i'm unique in that um my journey which i'm very open and honest with i'm sure as a um sports and entertainment lawyer. I'm sure Daniel and Rebecca, you get this all the time as well. Well, people will reach out to you if they're in law school or a young lawyer and want to get into sports and entertainment and they want to know how you got where you are. Can, I, can you share some knowledge on what I should be doing? Um, how can I avoid pitfalls? These are questions we get all the time, whether it's in your DMs or on LinkedIn or whatever. And so I'm very open and honest about my journey. Um, have I ever doubted myself? Absolutely, 100%. I didn't pass the bar the first time that I took it. I also, you know, had, um, when I first came out and started my firm, I was with a partner um, and we ended up splitting amicably, but it forced me to kind of go back to the drawing board and start over with rebranding and, you know, getting new clientele and all this other kind of stuff. So life just in general happens um, just because you're a lawyer doesn't stop life from happening people just think you just have money bags coming in that's not the case um at least not for me and Thanks. so there are <laughs> there are trust me because navian woo, ciao um that's not i think you know like you said it's not a straight line i think overcoming it first and foremost my faith 100 percent um, second behind that would be a good support team, friends and family and colleagues. I think having a good mentor, I have several mentors, um, when I first stepped out made all of the difference for me, um, because I did not practice in entertainment when I was at Cochrane. Um, and then I think the third thing would be also to taking it upon yourself to always be a student. I know that's the last thing you want to think about after you graduate. Um, but, you know, I have an office here in Atlanta and I have also have an office in Nashville. And so I have to do CLEs for both states. I do about almost three times the amount of CLEs that I need to each year. And that's because I'm just so adamant about making sure I'm trying to stay on top of what's going on, making sure I'm giving the best service to my clients and also making sure that I'm, you know, comporting with rule one, which is competence. Um, but I think those are the three things that really help build confidence so that that doubt just doesn't really have room to come in. I love it. I'll open it up, Daniel, Rebecca. Something, something Nicole mentioned, um, I always have this saying in the back of my mind, when you cease to learn, you cease to grow. And oftentimes people look at lawyers to answer all their questions, fix all their problems, but we also have to, you know, continue to grow and continue to learn and continue to stay, you know, up to these types of different trends going on because we aren't like an encyclopedia that have all the answers <laughs> in our head. And it's like, yes, I remember that. Um, but I think that's so important that you are a student of the game forever. I mean, I'm si about six years removed from law school, but I, you know, treat this as day one all the time. Like I got to grind like it was day one and I want to continue to elevate. And it, part of elevating is, is being a student. And, um, I know Nicole mentioned this, but yeah, nobody really wants to think of, oh, can I, um, you know, take more CLEs or like, what are the other conferences can I attend? Something that I think is really, that's really, really helped me is um, there's different like things like PLI or different lectures that you can just listen to when I'm folding clothes or cooking. I will put on a lecture about a new area that I don't know. And like, it doesn't, it's not as painful because I, you know, I'm being productive. But ultimately, like you got to continue to, you know, look into different resources that can that can help you grow as a as a professional, because if not, you, you will get left behind. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Daniel, is there anything that you like really struggle with on your path and and how did you overcome it? Yeah, my path definitely wasn't easy. And I think I over, I overcame it by getting comfortable with the L's. Um, getting comfortable with, with losing and, and 
and actually taking the time to sit down and reflect upon why it is I lost in that situation. Um, and I think with that adversity and, and getting comfortable with losing and getting comfortable with not having the answer to all the questions being asked, it was, was also my way, or it continues to be my way of developing myself in the field. I noticed that oftentimes when you, know, you get into, when you're in-house counsel at a particular company, uh, most attorneys have this thing about them where they feel like they have to have all the answers to the questions being asked. But my realization was, hey, I don't have all the answers to the questions that are being asked, but what I can do is find the answer to it. Let me, let me have a moment to um, really reflect upon what you're saying and I'll get back to you. And I got comfortable with, with that answer as well. So I have all these different processes that I go through, but for me, the most important thing is sort of shedding myself of the ego and sort of reducing that ego and realizing that, look, everyone in the law firm at some point went through this process of learning and everyone here was in the position that you're in right now. So mm -hmm. let's all develop alongside with that path of, of, of turmoil and frustration and losing. And so I, I'm, I'm now quite comfortable with, with losing. So when I win, it feels even more victorious. Sorry to get philosophical with you, but. <laughs> if that's the answer, that's the answer. And I think these are huge takeaways. And so if we can kind of put together everything that Nicole, Rebecca, and Daniel are saying right now, it's get comfortable with the losses, that life happens. Yes, even to us, the smartest of the smart as, <laughs> as attorneys, people who are often turned to for answers. But as Rebecca said, we have to stay hungry. We have to stay lifelong learners. Um, and the biggest thing that I really want to end on is Nicole saying that she had mentors that, you know, you have to have mentors along the way. And so I really want to open it up now. And, and maybe I'll start with Daniel and then go to Rebecca and end with Nicole of um, how have you been able to connect with more um, experienced attorneys in the industry? And how would you suggest that young lawyers go about building these relationships and leveraging them as they maybe look to pivot in their career? No, very important question. Um, for me, I was fortunate enough to, to work with um, attorneys that had been in the industry for, you know, a decade, well longer than a decade. And um, all of them had a certain level of professionalism that I was able to sort of emulate. And you would find versions of them that you would adapt to your style. And, that, and that's my recommendation is when you find attorneys that you can sort of levitate towards. And oftentimes it happens, you know, it's, it's, it's organic and it's authentic. I, I personally don't know how to do the outreach because I didn't have that experience. I was fortunate enough to just be exposed to them uh, while working as in-house counsel. Um, but I imagine that it happens also after you've sort of negotiated agreements and they're on the opposite end, because that, that's happened to me before actually, as in-house counsel being on the opposite end of someone that I negotiated an agreement with, and we just sort of clicked. And I said, oh, can I, I'm, I'm gonna add you on LinkedIn and we just have a, a, an authentic conversation and continue to stay in touch and bounce ideas off of them. I, I absolutely love that. I will tell two, two brief stories before I go to Rebecca, then Nicole, is that um, before going into sports and entertainment full-time, I did a very, very brief stint at personal injury. And I worked with a firm, but I knew it wasn't for me and I was leaving, I left. And I had a client who refused to let me go and was like, no, I'm coming with you. Please finish out my case. But I really just didn't know what I was doing. And it was against a you know, big insurance company, drunk driver, head on collision, and they didn't want to settle. And this lawyer was very, very experienced. And we did a deposition and we were approaching trial and I was kind of lost. And after a deposition, um, we were on a break and he's like, hey, you might want to file this. You might want to file that. And it was just like, but while we were in the deposition, he was aggressive. Like he was relentless and did not let up, but he extended a professional courtesy. And I always remember that as a young lawyer, that there is a difference between zealously advocating for your client and being professionally courteous. That just because you are negotiating with the full gusto for your client does not mean you have to 
be a jerk to the person across the table. And I always held that with me, you know, as I encounter younger attorneys of saying, hey, could you, you know, this is due, just want to remind you so and so, but still leveraging for my clients. And even now, as I've negotiated some deals with a major network and I saw clauses that just didn't make sense to me. And instead of being adversarial, I, I just kind of humbly approached and said, hey, I'm asking you not to be adversarial adversarial. This is literally just a learning lesson question for me. Why does your network use this? Why? Are, what is the intention behind this clause? And to really just kind of get that and use that as a learning lesson, I have been able to, to build those relationships with people who I was across the table with. And in future negotiations, it's made it easier for my clients to get the deals that they're ultimately looking for. So I'll open it up to Rebecca and then Nicole. How have you been able to connect with mentors and how would you suggest young lawyers leverage these relationships? Sure. Um, so I think this is, is really important, mostly because there's no point in reinventing the wheel. Someone has done this before and there's no point in you spinning your wheels, trying to figure it out, especially I know for me, I'm the first lawyer in my family, let alone obviously first entertainment lawyer. So there was a lot of figuring out to do. And I oftentimes think, you know, students and young lawyers don't know how to make that initial contact. Um, and, and really, that's why I started coaching coaching students and young lawyers young, younger than me um, but but actually some senior lawyers too I, I, I will tell you this it's it's like a it's a it's a sore spot for a lot of people because you don't want to like just approach them saying like hey I'd like a job right that's never going to work um, if you were in that person's position nine times out of ten you're not going to just be like here sure no problem that's not how it works I tell people to really build meaningful contacts it's not about you know, walking into a room, collecting 20 business cards or emailing 20 people, I think that it's more important to have more meaningful contacts because honestly, you only need one opportunity. You don't necessarily need 20 people in that room to give you a job. So I always say, who is someone that you, you know, look up to, you aspire to have a career similar to that person and really understand their path and their journey and get guidance from them, not just a handout. And when people, especially students, I see them pouring into the relationship and not just like a one way. It's it's a mutually beneficial connection, right? You don't want it to just be like, hey, I'm taking, 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 and you're not contributing to that. It's it's so important. And I tell that to people, even when you go into an interview, a lot of the times, like these cover letters say, you know, I'm able to hone my, um, you know, writing skills, et cetera, et cetera. But what do you bring to the company? What are you bringing to the company? Why should we hire you? Not just all the things that it will benefit. So I think having that mindset and thinking like this is a two-way street and thinking to yourself that it's not necessarily quality, but more so quantity has, you know, significantly helped me. And I, I tell this to everybody, every single job I've had, I have not submitted an application. Like it has been through a connection. It has been through a contact. It has been through someone reaching out to me, someone saying something. And that's because I take the time to pour into those relationships. And I'm not just, you know, part of a stack of a hundred resumes that never get reviewed. So um, that, that would be my tidbit. <laughs> I love it. Nicole, you're on mute. Sorry. <laughs> I agree um, with what Rebecca said. Absolutely. 100%. You can tell um, especially as an employer, you can tell when it's graduation season and internship season and people will, sh you know, shoot you a whole bunch of messages and say, Hey, just wanted to see what you guys have, you know, which I, I applaud them, especially during the times that we're in now, um, you have to try to get your opportunities where you can. Um, but like Rebecca said, what are you offering? What do you bring to the table other than just a cold resume? Um, nurturing and pouring into those relationships and making them a little bit more organic, I think goes a long way, at least with me when I'm looking for someone. Also too, I think, um, I don't know, and it may just be my generation, but I don't know too many lawyers that go to big law and stay, um, mm -hmm. you know, to get on the partner track or, or what had you most people like myself go get the experience and then at some point either want to try something else whether that's going in-house or hanging out a shingle and I think even though you even if you get treated like you know the low level associate having a good attitude and a good work ethic will make people want to mentor you when you do leave because you left on a good note you left a good taste in people's mouth um, and if you were just, you know, a terrible associate, nobody's going to want to help you when you get out on your own. So that would be the other thing. And then something you said, Shay, I would just um, piggyback off of that were 
mentors who didn't even know that they were mentors, um, especially with contract review and negotiation. Sometimes I'd get an agreement and I'd be like, this is a actually really good clause that I don't know why I don't have this in my, <laughs> in my agreement. And they actually don't even know that they're actually mentoring me. Um, and I'm just like, oh, I'll take that. And, you know, <laughs> I'll <laughs> insert it into my thing and, you know, tweak it for whatever the client needs. But I think, um, looking at contract after contract after contract is another way of how you learn. And there are people, very seasoned attorneys and not so seasoned attorneys younger than me that have had contracts that I thought, you know, this is pretty solid. Let me, you know, go back and look at mine and see, you know, I need to update some things. So sometimes you get mentored by people and they don't even know it. Um, and then also just the traditional way, obviously pre-pandemic, I did a lot of, you know, networking events and joined all the bar associations and, and things like that. And you meet a lot of great people that way as well. Um, even virtually now still meet a lot of great people. Um, so, you know, I kind of agree with what everyone has said, but I think for me, the main thing is making sure that you leave a good impression when you were in that position. And those people are the people that have, you know, helped me. Like there's people that I used to work with at Cochrane that I still talk to and will help me with anything that I need. And, and if you don't mind me piggybacking, piggybacking off of Nicole, something you said um, really just jogged my memory on something. A lot of the times um, we are always kind of looking above us to, you know, for mentorship or for guidance. But I say this to students, say you're a 1L and there's a 2L who just finished the internship, just finished the summer associate. This is one of the best resources you're gonna have. They just secured that opportunity. And oftentimes we don't want to look at our peers at our own level because of, I don't know why, but I know that is like a really, really important, like just resource that can help you navigate because I guarantee you partners or, you know, really senior counsel, they're so far removed from what it is right now and, and, and how to navigate the right now, especially during COVID. Um, so I, I always say utilize your peers. They are a wealth of information that is oftentimes underutilized. Oof, I love that. I love that. I think Issa Rae talks a lot about that, about networking across instead of trying to network up, that everyone's always so focused on networking up that we forget about networking across. And so I absolutely love that. You guys, everyone who is participating in the audience, number one, thank you for joining. I'm going to have one more question for all of our panelists. And so if you have questions that you would like answered, please be sure to either drop them in the chat or drop them in the Q&A. We will open it up shortly for question and answer. So this is your opportunity. This is a no judgment zone. We have all kind of shared our, our vulnerable things here. And so this is the time to ask questions. Do not be afraid, drop them in the chat. And so I will open it up to go around for the last question in any order, whoever wants to take it. And so my final question would be, if you could go back and talk to yourself freshly passing the bar and you are now attorney you, what do you go back and tell that truly young, fresh, wet behind the ears attorney version of yourself that you wish you knew now? Oh, go ahead, Rebecca. No, I didn't know. I wasn't sure who the question was directed to. Go for it, Nicole. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, I think I would say several things. Um, <laughs> one is be patient. It's going to take some time. Um, I feel like, I guess technically I'm the, on the cusp of millennialism. Like I'm at the very beginning and, but I find a lot of the younger entrepreneurs, millennial entrepreneurs, Gen Z entrepreneurs that I work with just want everything just right away. I don't want to work for anyone else. I want to be Insta famous. I want to have, you know, I want to get paid $650,000 for a post, that kind of thing, just right away. Um, and I think that is something that a lot of young attorneys that I see um, they don't necessarily think that it's, you know, a microwave, you know, push of a button, but I, I still think that they think it happens faster than it actually does. Um, so patience is um, number one. I think the other thing that I, so be patient with yourself because you're like uh, Daniel said, you're not going to know everything right away. Um, I had to get very comfortable with, I don't know as an answer, but I will get it to you by such and such date. Mm -hmm. um, 
and my clients had to get comfortable with, we're waiting to hear from legal. Um, and so I think that, and then the second thing that I would tell myself freshly after uh, passing the bar is um, kind of what you were talking about before, which is working your connections laterally is to keep those relationships going, you know, as long as you can, because not everybody, not everybody's going to stay in the same practice area that they start out with as soon as they pass the bar. Some people expand, some people change tracks. And it's happened to me a lot where people who were doing labor and employment five years ago are now doing exactly what I need in finance or tax or whatever. And I'm so glad that I kept in contact with them and nurtured those relationships because they're now in a position for exactly where I'm at now. Um, so, you know, just realize that you can't do it by yourself. You, you need other people and the help of your colleagues and also be patient. That would, that, that would be my answer. All right, Rebecca, Daniel, anybody? Rebecca, you want to go or? Go for it. <laughs> I would say um, for me, it would be spend more time reflecting on what you want from the profession. Um, and it's hard when you're a young attorney because you really don't know what you want. Uh, you probably have an idea of what you want. And if you do know what you want, that's great. You're ahead of the game. Um, but for me, I felt as if I didn't really spend enough time thinking about that. And it's, it could be also like what you want 10 years out or to be what you want in a job, what's your ideal workspace and what you want that work environment to be like and the people that you work with. Um, but I probably, that'd be the one advice I'd give to my, I'd ask the question I'd ask myself is, what do I want from this profession? I think that's really good because um, a lot of people kind of just fall into something, but if you're intentional about what it is that you want to do and you're strategic, it's it's very, um, I, I always say like, if you have this, this goal and you plan, but you're a little bit off plan, it's better than just kind of falling into something. Um, that's really great advice. Um, if I could say anything to myself, I would say, and I still do, to be quite honest, I say closed mouths don't get fed. That is like my mm -hmm. motto in life. And um, I think oftentimes it's funny, my, one of the workshops that I teach, it's called shoot your shot. And a lot of people talk about shooting their shot in their uh, personal lives, but they don't talk about shooting their shot in their professional life. And it's the same it's, it's the same thing. Oftentimes we, we're just too scared to ask for the opportunity. We're too scared to ask for more work or whatever it may be, the area of interest that you're in. And I always say like, you just, you have to bet on yourself. And even if the confidence level is not there, like everyone is a human. Everyone started at one point. Everybody was clueless at one point. And like, recognize that and give yourself that grace and that ability to say, you know what? I don't know this, but I'm going to learn. And I tell people like, just stay ready so you don't have to get ready, right? There's often times when I reach out to folks and see if I can, you know, have 15 minutes of their time, whatever it may be, make those 15 minutes useful. Don't sit there asking questions. I mean, I've gotten sometimes questions like, what practice areas do you have? That's information you can find out online. Show these people that you have prepared, you come correct, and you want to really understand the intricacies of what they do so that you can now take that and, and, and build. Um, asking these surface level questions, it's going to get, you know, especially questions that you can find answers to, I always say like, it's showing that person who's given you time that you don't really value the time because you haven't done the work in advance. So I say this to say like, be prepared because there will be a time when someone will give you an opportunity. It might not happen when you want, but when it does, at least you're ready and you can hit the ground running. Oof, I like that. You stay ready so you don't have to get ready. That is a great way for us to end this portion. There is one question that was dropped in the chat and it was by anonymous attendee. It says, how do you keep relationships with your former classmates, peers that may not understand the importance of building relationships or may not want to continue to foster relationships? And I think this actually goes back um, for the sake of time, I'll go ahead and answer it. This goes back to what Nicole 
mentioned before about someone mentoring you but not knowing they're mentoring you and i also think it's the same about fostering relationships you don't need to make this uh kind of the yes no maybe relationship fostering of like are we in a relationship are we fostering it um when it comes to your peers but i do think that there are really discreet and genuine and authentic ways to foster relationships if linkedin does an incredible job of doing the work for you they let you know when your connections are on the news in the news they pre-populate the response for you when someone gets a promotion or a new job or is mentioned in the media that is a very very easy way to foster a relationship to keep your name on that person's mind to congratulate them as they go and for you to understand what are they notable for what are they a thought leader for and what are they moving towards in their career so that when something does come about that makes sense to connect with them with this isn't a dry connection, that you've kept this connection warm because you've stayed in touch, even if it's in these small social media ways. So it doesn't always have to be an outright like, hey, let's grab coffee. You can find these, these other ways of staying in touch um, that are a little bit more organic, especially for people who might not be as receptive to keeping a mainline relationship with you. So with that, I once again want to thank Daniel, Nicole, and Rebecca for their time today in joining the panel. I want to, before we close it out, turn it back to Young Lawyers Division Chair for us for to have closing remarks. So I will give it back over to you, Chloe Woods. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Shay. And again, I'm the chair elect, so I just want to make sure that I'm not stepping on Onika's toes, the current YLD chair. Um, but thank you all for giving of your time and talents to be here with us this afternoon. Definitely appreciate it. You dropped a lot of gems and we learned a lot from you. Um, let's see. Oh, Anika wants to remind us all that the uh, 2021 Young Lawyer Summit Building Bridges in a Challenging Legal Landscape will be Friday, June the 18th, 2021. And there is a link for the complimentary re registration in the chat. So we'll leave that up for a moment. If you guys want to go ahead and click that, um, pull that up, register for it. It's going to be some great programming amongst multiple organizations that are partnering together. Um, and so I really, really recommend you all attending that. And so the last two things we want to plug are our last two series in last two in this series, the Young Lawyer on the Go, on June the 23rd at 5 p.m. Eastern. It is the pitfall, pitfalls in best practices of legal pra uh, practice management for young lawyers. Um, so if you are thinking about hanging a shingle, if you've already hung a shingle, if you just kind of need to know what to do next or how do you start a business bank account for your law firm, that's the place that you need to be on June the 23rd. And then our final um, program in our series is June 30th at 6.30 p.m. It's how to use ADR to develop and sustain a successful law practice. So if you are interested in mediation or curious about it, maybe you want to be a mediator at some point down the line, um, that's another great program on the 30th for you to come and check out. Thank you again for joining us and everyone have a great evening.